In this video, I'm going to introduce you to Jim Harmer from Backfire. Jim, good to see you. Thank you for joining us on Ultimate Reloader. Yeah, good to see you again, Gavin. So a lot of my viewers watch Backfire, but for those of uh, my viewers that are late to the party, tell me back, about Backfire. What is it? Backfire is a gun channel for your average gun person. Uh, it's, I, I would say, mostly bolt action, precision hunting kind of stuff, more than the tactical mm -hmm. pistol. But it's also just anything guns. I, I kind of, the avatar, the person that I customize everything to is just, you know, like your neighbor, the gun guy who goes hunting, yep. has a couple pistols and ARs, you know, but I'm mostly into the precision rifle and stuff. So it's kind of what so I do. Does it does it bother you that your logo is a handgun, but most of what you do is is rifle oriented? <laughs> it bothers me a little bit. It bothers me a little bit. I've tried making iterations of the logo with with a long gun, and it just doesn't it just doesn't look that cool. So, yep. rifles are hard. They're long and skinny. Yep. Yep. Uh, it's so tough to make a good us, logo. Tell us about how Backfire came to be. How did you stumble into this whole YouTube obsession and channel and lifestyle? Well. Okay, it's a little bit of a story, so I'll compress. <laughs> I went to law school. I bought a really expensive wall decoration in a degree because during law school, I started a blog about photography and it really took mm -hmm. off and it was earning good money. And so by the time I graduated law school, I'm like, I guess I'm a blogger. And so I did that for five years full time. I was a blogger and podcaster about, about photography, landscape photography. And then I started creating online brands in other spaces, RVs, pocket knives, pets, boating, whatever my hobbies <laughs> were at the minute. And uh -huh. I've kind of built and sold um, like 15 different brands uh, that wow. I kind of build traffic to and stuff. Anyway, then I started a company called Income School that grew pretty big. We got to 80 employees, but a lot of those were part time. Um, and that was teaching people how to create their own online brands. Well, because we were teaching people how to do it, I needed to keep, you know, making examples and showing how to do it. And so we, we started Backfire really as like a one hour a week kind of uh, experiment just because I was into guns and hunting. And mm -hmm. anyway, I sold my company um, to my business partner. And when I sold it, I said, well, I'll take Backfire and I'll just kind of grow that as the next thing. And so... Um, it had under a thousand, under a hundred thousand subscribers when I, I took it over a year and a half ago. So it's about three years old, and uh, mm -hmm. just been now it's full time. It's what I work on. So quick story about Backfire and Ultimate Reloader. I feel so bad about this. Jim sent me an email, and the email said something like, "Hey, I have this channel. It has eighty thousand subscribers. I have a couple questions about reloading," and it slipped through the cracks. And I completely missed it. Well, J Jim and I met at the SHOT Show last year, and I feel better about uh, <laughs> now taking this opportunity to, to finally talk with you on the channel because I love what you do, and what you do is different than what I do, you know? Yeah, uh, slip through the cracks. You're like, who's this joker? We're not talking with this guy. Uh, I, I literally <laughs> didn't even see the email. I feel so bad. No, but it's, it's totally it's, fine. <laughs> it's funny how these things happen you know and and i love the opportunity to collaborate with other youtubers and you know what you're doing when it comes to content for those folks that just have a passion and want to you know do do a, a youtube channel or a blog or whatever i love helping the guys that are just getting started because when i started i didn't have that help it was literally just a hobby for me you know and i i made some fundamental mistakes from the get go i was focused on views not subscribers initially i didn't realize that kind of your value as a channel is is your following and, and and so on and so forth so you know we get inspired by backfire we look at what you do and we we draw inspiration from it you know obviously we're we're different we're a little bit more focused on you know super in-depth technical stuff and rifle builds and all that but i i love the opportunity to talk with you and to have you on as a guest so that my audience can hear your perspective. So I have a, I sat down for a few minutes and I thought of a whole list of questions. I love this next one. All right, good. Well, hopefully I will too. What is your favorite hunting cartridge? Uh, you know, people are gonna, <laughs> people are gonna roll their eyes here, but it's the 7PRC. And you're gonna nice. roll your eyes for good reason, because you, to mention a cartridge that's only a couple months old, 
when there are so many cartridges with decades and decades of history may sound yeah. like you know you've 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 listened to too much marketing. Um, but the reason I say that is it really fits a spot that I've wanted to have filled for a while. Um, you know, I like all the new stuff. It's fine, mm -hmm. you know, if, if you like your old truck that, you know, does everything, it's fine, <laughs> good. But some people want to update and get all the newest, latest, and greatest, right, yep. with their truck. It's the same thing with cartridges. Is it a drastic difference from a 7 Mag? No, it's definitely not. But mm -hmm. it's such a nice balance. I like 7 millimeter because you're getting less recoil, burning less powder, going a little bit faster than the 30 cals. But it's big enough, you're punching a big enough of hole in the animal that, you know, mm -hmm. it's going to make a difference. Also, you can get to those heavier bullet weights, has the faster twist rate, so you can um, yep. use some of those longer bullets. Um, and it's, I like the spot that it fits, like if you mention it, you know, you have like this this line between high, re high recoil really fast and really slow, yep. low recoil. I just like where it fits in there, that it's, it's fast enough to to feel like you're going to be shooting really flat, but not too much that you, that you won't, uh, you know, have recoil yep. issues and be burning out barrels, throwing things like that. So that's why I like 7PRC. Yeah, you know, I would probably today give you the same answer and for, for a lot of the same reasons. Interesting thing, so I built two rifles. So, so first off, to back up, Jim is the trailblazer here, right? I, <laughs> I was a part of the Hornady program, so I had the rifle builder's kit, and it, uh, I couldn't really talk about it until general public availability. So I was a little bit jealous of your ability, and in your position, I would have done the same exact thing. Let's go out, let's be the first guy to build a rifle, let's show it on YouTube first, and all that. Um, now, I was able to watch your videos and get a little bit of a field education with it, combined with you know whatever resources I had. Uh, and based on Hornady's input, I built the 22-inch and I built the 28-inch, which was kind of an interesting opposite ends of the spectrum thing. One more for suppressed and then, you know, one more for something I could shoot and not feel beat up with the recoil. That, in fact, that's this rifle back here. It's currently a 338 Lapua, but it was, it was originally a 7PRC. You mentioned the recoil. The braked 22-inch rifle that I built Although every, anybody on my team that has shot it has been shocked at how little recoil it is. It is a pretty effective break, SRS, Type Pro 3, but what a rifle. I mean, the, the 22 inch barrel is probably what I would take hunting as well. Now, if I was going to do long range, I'd get this rifle out, you know, but uh, I agree. I, I think the fast twist as standard is, is definitely key. I think that the biggest challenge with 7PRC is going to be the ability for Hornady to supply components and ammunition to people, you know? Yeah, and surprisingly, right now, it's pretty easy to get 7PRC ammo. And the reason I say that is I went to three gun stores yesterday, and all three had 7PRC on the shelf. Now, the reason yep. is because you it's going to be pretty hard to find a 7PRC gun that's out on the shelf and available to buy right now. And so yep. for this very narrow window, there's more ammo <laughs> than guns. I don't think it's going to last long, but right now it is. Um, mm -hmm. I've been reloading for mine and I think I will, but really I got the factory ammo because I want the brass off of it. Yep. Now in your, in your Mexico hunt that you just went on, Audad and, and Deer down there, yeah. did, you had to use uh, guide rifles. I think you were shooting a 300 Win Mag straight pull. Is that right? Yep, that's right. Did you wish that you had your 7 PRC? Oh, so much. It was <laughs> tough. So here's the situation. So on the YouTube video, you know, everything's condensed. You, you know, you, you don't want to be in a video and like just giving, you know, the edge cases and full long explanations. People just want to see the hunt, right? But it created a problem for me because I was using somebody else's gun, um, some friends of ours down in Mexico. Now, down in Mexico, they have to smuggle 100% of the ammo. Has to get smuggled across the border. Um, really? They can buy it from the Mexican army, but it's uh, they only have kind of junky ammo. It just doesn't really work. And so each shot costs $35 um, what? For sh per shot. And so when we got there, we we're like, well, we really want to like side in and stuff. And this is a takedown rifle. And it's like, oh, we're just putting that barrel on there. I would like to see where we're sided in, you know, <laughs> but it was like, 
All right, you get one shot. <laughs> it's 35 bucks. And it was on steel at wow. 230 yards. And we're like, well, it rang the steel. And so anyway, it was difficult hunting. And then people were eating us alive on YouTube saying like, you know, ah, you missed this small javelina at 300 yards. And it's like, in that kind of situation, you're just, we shot, I shot the first one and just somebody's like, where did I hit? You know, and you got to make adjustments. <laughs> so anyway, it made me look like a horrible shot in that video, but everything we shot was dead. You know, we didn't, nice. didn't wound any animals, but still people got on my case about it. Oh man, that's funny. Um, okay. So next question. Now this is a controversial one. Are you ready for it? Do you have to have a man bun? to shoot 6.5 Creedmoor? <laughs> well, I don't have one, so I'm all right. Um, <laughs> but here's, here's what I would say. I, I, so first of all, I shoot 6.5 Creedmoor more than any other cartridge. It's the number yep. one cartridge that I shoot for a couple reasons. One is just when a new rifle comes out, it's what the manufacturers are making first. And so mm -hmm. when they're sending me rifles, it's usually a 6.5 Creedmoor. The second reason that, I, that it's the most shot for me is it's easier as a reviewer to shoot something in 6.5 Creedmoor compared to 270, 300 Win Mag, that you might just have to try more loads. There are just sure. more variables in what makes a load successful there everything tighter tolerance, there's just not that much creativity that can happen uh, in that load. And so generally I have to try fewer loads if we're talking about you know, one of these modern cartridges like the 6.5 Creedmoor. Yep. Anyway, so I end up shooting a lot. I also end up shooting it a lot for hunting because my kids are you know, young teens and so it's a great mm -hmm. cartridge for them. But I am so tired of Creedmoor madness. I am so tired of going to the gun store and it's like, 80% Creedmoors on the shelf. Mm -hmm. And you're like, mm -hmm. there's not a, I went to Sportsman's Warehouse the other day. They did not have a single 30-06 on the shelf. Probably get wow. over a hundred guns, not a single 30-06. I am eager for that to end. Yeah, and the, part of why I wanted to ask you the question was just, I think it's interesting as men online, how, how our behavior manifests itself. You know, like why does someone care what someone else is shooting? I guess is a part of the equation. And then I get really opinionated about things, whether it be uh, the fact that I like Cummins turbo diesel and I don't want a diesel V8 or, you know, uh, the seven PRC, you know, compared to some other things. Uh, I'm hoping that people can basically shed some of that and just lean into, Hey, we're all shooting together, you know, and mm -hmm. regardless of what you're choosing, Let's help each other. Let's help the sport. Let's help to a, you know, that, that, the whole thing. It's just funny how guys are, you know, we're, yeah, we're all it, prone it to is. it. And it's funny. It depends what your discipline is in shooting because you talk to some PRS guys and stuff and they're like, 6.5 Creedmoor is kind of heavy recoil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, they're all shooting sixes. Um, and so it, it is funny. For hunting, I, you know, I have never seen a situation where a 6.5 Creedmoor was not enough for a deer. I've never mm -hmm. seen that. I mm -hmm. have shot with 6.5 Creed more bigger animals like Blue Wildebeest, which was kind of a weird situation. We weren't expecting mm -hmm. to hunt Blue Wildebeest. Anyway, eh, I don't know. It was not enough for that. Shot was on the money and it just, mm -hmm. it brought it down, but it wasn't in the way you'd want to see it. You know, I, a right. more effective cartridge would have been the right tool for that situation. Yep. And so I, I like joking around with people, whatever, uh, whatever, some big old dude with a 6.5 Creed more going elk hunting. Um, but <laughs> at the same time, uh, they're just tools, you know, DeWalt, Milwaukee, whatever, just pick one. Yep. It's interesting that you uh, mentioned PRS shooting, because I think that's where one of the misconceptions is, is, is some guys online will say, oh, you're not mad enough to shoot a 300 Win Mag. And it's like, when we say too much recoil, it's about the rifle can't move off of the target. You want to see the trace. You want to see your signature. You know, it, that's what it's really about. And that's why I like to run really heavy rifles. When I mm -hmm. built my 223 trainer, I, I don't know what the weight is offhand, but, you know, M24 barrel, uh, weighted down stock. It's a super heavy rifle with hardly any recoil. And that means it's a great training rig. It's a great shooting rig you know, uh, maybe up to, you know, rock chucks and coyotes. And then there's other, other cartridges, you know, that, that span that gap. So you were talking about 6.5 Creedmoor and it being inherently 
uh, a known good entity for you, right? In terms of the loads that you've got experience with it, all that. And you also mentioned other guys going towards sixes. Now, have you had the opportunity to run a six dasher or a six GT? Yeah, I've shot them. I don't do a lot of, well, I don't do any of like the PRS competition. I do NRL 22, which I really enjoy. Oh, cool. But from a competition mm -hmm. standpoint, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't ever done any PRS. I'd like to try it just to have the experience, but I don't. Yep. No, I, the reason I mentioned those cartridges is that I've found that they, uh, six dasher especially, I've done a lot more with that than I have the GT. Just inherently easy to tune, easy to load, light recoiling, I, good ballistics out to a thousand. It's like, it's really good stuff. I think you said that exactly right. I think some people have questions when we're talking about inherently accurate, which obviously mm -hmm. is a little bit of a misnomer of the term itself because it's not like it's yeah. a heat seeking missile that's going to suddenly, that cartridge is going to, you know, make itself more accurate, whatever precision accuracy. You get it. But yep. I think the way you said it was exactly right. It's uh, the fact that it's a known entity and you, it, fewer variables. That's it. With the modern cartridges, it's like, well, you just have a lot fewer options of seating depth mm -hmm. now, right? Like you can only go so far uh, because it's it's a compressed space. Um, and because of that, there's one less variable that needs to be tweaked nearly as much. And so, yep. yeah, it's just going to make it a lot easier to tune, just like you said. Um, so I, I, you know, some people wonder, say like, oh, I don't get it. You, you know, you can shoot 308, you can shoot 300 Win Mag, these old cartridges, perfectly accurate. So why does everybody talk about this? And I think it only makes sense to a reloader. I think if you're buying mm -hmm. factory ammo, you're left with questions and this doesn't make any sense to you. But as soon as you've done that process of load development and you see like, oh yeah, there's just less that you can even tune here. It just, mm -hmm. yeah, anyway, makes it easier. Yep. Okay, so switching gears, what is it like being a gun tuber? I'll give you a tour. Are you ready? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. This is what it's like. Uh, you won't see on the, uh, on the webcam here, but I'll take everybody okay. through. It is tax stamps on my desk that I finally got a couple suppressors in. Nice. It is wood piled up against the side because I tried using you know, a gun safe, and then companies send so many guns that it doesn't fit anymore. So now it's a complete room of my house that I've, I'm installing a safe door on. And I have one closet for guns that I'm not allowed to show yet, um, <laughs> a closet for ammunition and stuff that needs to be fixed. And then looking all around the room are different guns and like piles of scopes and everything that companies send. I think probably the biggest misnomer, the thing that people don't understand, sometimes people will say like, ah, they sent you that scope for free. That's why you're giving a positive review. I'm like, when I come home and I see a scope on my, on my doorstep, I am not excited. It's terrifying <laughs> because now it's like another video you got to produce, put, yeah. putting different stuff out there and they do yep. not pay me for the gear. Um, and so it's like, it's fine, but it means I've got to, it's just more work. Like, believe me, I have all the guns and ammunition that you could want. Right. And so mm -hmm. when somebody sends something, it's, it's not exciting. It's just another thing that needs to be done. Now, having said that, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's the, that's the honest side. And the other t troubling thing is like, you know, it's just so much work to get the, get a new gun in. You got to have multiple loads ready to go because I can't just say the accuracy is bad, but I only had one load. That's not going to work. Right. People are going to be annoyed at that. They want you to yeah. really test this thing. So I've got to have multiple loads for that gun, I've got to have a scope. I've got to get it scoped. I got to run to the gun store, pick them up. Then I've got to, you know, go out to the, when you go out to the field, I've got to have all the cameras and lights and audio mm -hmm. and everything ready to go. My wife comes out and she films the videos, which makes a huge difference for me. Oh, cool. And then, and then sometimes like it rains in the middle of the video and you're like, ah, you come yep. home, bring everything back and go back. Anyway, it's, it's a lot of, hassle compared to other channels I've done where I can just sit here and just talk, you know? Um, yep. But what I would also say is it has not changed my love for guns and hunting. I get asked that question all the time. Like, is mm -hmm. it just work? 
it's not work. It's not. It, it, <laughs> my fun is in, indistinguishable, indistinguishable from the work. Um, people have always told me that because I've done different brands and you know always my hobbies, and it doesn't change. I still enjoy the hobby. It's great. Right. Yeah, I, I can agree on a lot of that. And you know, you talked about the pile of tax stamps. We we started that way, and started with going to the gun shop for transfers. And finally, you know, partly because I've, I'm so invested in gunsmithing, I just said, I have all this equipment. It's not really being used day in and day out. I'm building rifles once in a while for myself on the channel. Let's start a gun shop, and let's be a manufacturer, and let's get the SOT. And I'll say, there's a huge overhead to that, right? If I wasn't running a legitimate gunsmithing business, it wouldn't be worth it because you've got ATF inspections, you've got insurance, you've got security, all that stuff. And so that's how, that's how we can have it make sense. And then also living here on site at the range, you know, we can kind of go outside and, and, and shoot and all that. But I, I resonated with several of the things that you said. For me, there's some really exciting moments when something completely new and novel shows up. But frequently it is like, oh boy, this is work. Cause it's not just holding the camera and shooting, right? It's planning, it's all of the research, it's all of the results and the statistics and the post-production and dealing. The other thing that you didn't even mention is YouTube and the tech industry hates us. They hates couldn't us. hate us more. Yeah. Hates us. Yeah. And you, you and I are law abiding citizens that are pro to a pro empowering women, pro empowering people to enjoy the sport. It's not like we're the guys that are out there, you know, dealing drugs and dealing in stolen stolen firearms and doing crimes and all that. So anyways, I don't normally talk politics at all. That felt good to say a couple of things there. <laughs> yeah, the, the YouTube thing is absolutely absurd. I just got a strike on my channel because I unscrewed a suppressor. It was a total of under two seconds. I think it was 1.8 seconds of the video wow. um, from a video from a year ago uh, where I unscrewed a suppressor. And so I thought, huh, you, like you go through and you read the rule and it just, I'm sorry, it just that flatly does not violate the rule because it says mm -hmm. adding, uh, you know, to adding to the rifle. And it says that it has to be a homemade suppressor that they have issue with. This wasn't a homemade suppressor. Like I read right. through it and I'm like, I, but I, I didn't break the rule. And they don't mm -hmm. care, eh, demonetized, whatever. Um, it just, it, it's happening at such scale right now, it's insane. I, I don't know about you, but I, I know of only one other channel that hasn't received a strike from YouTube over the, since like a week before SHOT Show is when it began. Um, and so it's been crazy, yeah. So you and Peter Milan from Impact Shooting published some stories around this about a year and a half ago, a year ago. Yep. And what's not clearly documented, and I found the documentation at one point, can't find it, someone asked just last week about this, is if your channel is monetized, that's a different tier of strike worthiness and a different tier of can and can't do. And since I turned off monetization in 2017, I've only gotten strikes for things that were things like AR-15 builds and that sort of thing. So I'm not sure exactly how to even quantify what I can, can and cannot do. But we yeah. have moved to, to Rumble. Rumble, everything that we have is on Rumble and we're gonna start doing some Rumble exclusives for things like AR-15 builds and any of that stuff that YouTube determines is, is strictly hands off. So that, that's kind of part of our strategy. That's good, and I, I, I'm frustrated with Rumble, well, for a couple of reasons, but um, like I, I'm Backfire TV on Rumble. I'm Backfire mm -hmm. TV and not Backfire because somebody else created a Backfire channel and started uploading my videos. Well, I emailed their support about it, and I said, like, I, I even sent them a picture of my driver's license, and I'm like, look, I'm the guy on all the videos. Here's my driver's yeah. license. Like, pretty <laughs> yeah, tough to mess this up. And I'm like, that's not me. That's not my channel, Backfire. Uh, and they did nothing. They didn't shut it down. They emailed back, wow. and they're like, well, we can't verify it's you. And I'm like, what else do you want? You want my passport? Yeah. Like, let's do this. Anyway, it's, it's frustrating to me because now anybody who searches Backfire goes to a channel that isn't owned by me. So yep. anyway, I, I would uh, like to do it. The other thing is the interface, it just feels old on Rumble. Oh yeah. They, I, I wanna see them update. I'm really, I'm going in on Twitter and, and 
to be fair, I, I'm glad Rumble exists and I'm publishing every week mm -hmm. on, on Rumble. I'm all about it. It's great. That's just a little frustration I'm having. But sure. the other place that I'm really interested in is Twitter. I've never been a tweeterer person, um, but <laughs> when Elon Musk bought it and he has said many times over the last couple of months, we're working on adding video. We want video, video, video on Twitter. And so I'm like, okay, mm. that sounds pretty good. Um, so I've joined Twitter. I'm Backfire Jim on Twitter. And, okay. you know, I've never been interested in Twitter, but honestly, I'm starting to enjoy it. And if they add video and Elon Musk is in charge of it, promising free speech, that could be a good place for us. Very interesting. Yeah, I, I agree with you about Rumble. And, and currently, there's no one there. We have 1% subscriber base compared to YouTube. Granted, we've been on YouTube since 07. Uh, I think if, I think things could go two ways with YouTube. I think we saw a lot of backlash a year and a half ago when they mm -hmm. when they were shutting down Brownells with no warning, right? Yep. Uh, and they got that reinstated. Then they went to the three strikes and you're out policy, right? Uh, I think there was a you know 50% of the people out there want to see gun content, and they they saw that what YouTube was doing wasn't fair and isn't free speech. So we could continue to glide along like we are there, or they'll clamp down after another mass shooting or whatever happens because they're cowards and don't care about actual real results. They care about CYA and mm -hmm. political liabilities and, and lawyers and liability. So if we get to a point where you can't show anything on YouTube, the alternate platform of choice will probably start to see a surge of subscribers and a surge of, of traffic. Until then, for me, it's a contingency plan. Yep, and it's a good one. Uh, we've got to have something because, yeah, they could shut us down at any moment. The, the really yep. frustrating thing is if I felt confident that they were going to follow their policy, I'm like, okay, we, you know, we, we got rules of the game. I might not agree with them, but they're rules of the game. The problem is they keep violating their own policies. You know, I, yep. where, I, where I read through the rule and it's like, you know, I'm a lawyer. I'm pretty good at reading through a rule. And I just, it just <laughs> did not violate the rule. I got right. demonetized on a video where I spun the turret on a scope. Whoa. That was it. Demonetized. Uh, it's wow. like, wait, wait, I didn't modify the gun. It's not right. even the gun itself. It's the scope and it's not modifying. It's just that's how you use it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's not like I even was using a screwdriver and removing the turret cap or anything. I just spun the, the turret and that was enough. Uh, so These are anyway, I just wish they would follow their own rules. <laughs> yeah. These are some of the same people. I just saw an ad for a video game and they showed a, a sniper engagement. And there it was, the entire cartridge flying through the air towards the enemy. And I just thought, literally, th these, those are the kinds of people that are acting out of fear and instituting policy. And the, the policies are not well-defined enough. They, mm -hmm. don't, they don't go into enough detail. I, and I, I wonder if that's purposeful on their part so that they can make these subjective claims, you know, anyhow. Yeah, I, they definitely do. And at the bottom of those rules, it says, and other, basically, and other things that we just deem wrong. It's like, right. well, how am I supposed right. to follow that rule? That's, <laughs> you know. Yep. Okay. Okay. So to switch gears entirely, tell me about some of the favorite stories. Maybe pick one or two, three, whatever. Favorite stories that you've published. Oh, man. Um, you know, I really... Oh, I don't know. There's so so many videos. I enjoy all of them, but I enjoy them for short periods of time. Probably the piece of content that I'm most proud of um, mm -hmm. was I did a video of the best scope under five hundred dollars, and it yep. was just hundreds of hours of testing um, mm -hmm. those scopes, and I learned so much uh, to be able to share because you know you go to the store and you're picking a scope, like you don't know what's best. Like you can look at the specs, but like you're in a store looking through the scope. It's so hard to even tell how this, how's this going to do in low light. You know, how sharp really is this when you're looking 50 feet across the store? Um, mm -hmm. It's tough. Anyway, so I was really proud of that piece of content because it just, it was so much effort into it. Very much like the, uh, you know, you did the best single stage reloading press. You know exactly how mm -hmm. much effort goes into a video like that. Um, yep. And so that one, that one I think was a big one for me. Also, I have been, I did a video on the, the CVA Scout. It's a $350 break action single shot rifle. 
Um, and I just put in 300 blackout with a suppressor and I just kind of went through showing how quiet a suppressed rifle could be. I often hear people in our industry saying like, ah, suppressors, they, it's not Hollywood quiet. It's not really that quiet. And I'm like, if you shoot a suppressed subsonic round, it is Hollywood quiet. If you're shooting out of an action that will also keep the sound in, you know, if you're yeah. shooting out of an AR, yep. there's still quite a bit of sound. But yep. it, like an, in a brake barrel or a bolt action where there's no sound coming out of the action and you're subsonic, so under around 1,100 feet per second and suppressed, yeah, it sounds yep. like psh, it, that's it. One of the most fun rifle packages we put together is the Henry X model 3030. And we did a subsonic 3030 load with it with a 30 cal can. And it's just like what you're saying. And when, when you're shooting at the steel targets up on the hill, and you have the, uh, we still use the ear pro typically, unless we're doing a, a 22 long rifle suppressed. The sound of the steel clanking is so much more defined and loud when there's not the boom, you know, or the yeah. crack, right, uh -huh. of the supersonic. Love that. Um, so let's let's talk about that for people that maybe haven't had that experience. So yep. for me at least, tell me what you do. If I'm shooting a rifle with a break on it, I have two kinds mm -hmm. of ear, ear pro. I wear the little plugs inside and muffs on top. Mm -hmm. Just too many times when I've had, you know, trying to get the best ear pro out there, I pull the trigger on a on a braked rifle and it still rings your ears. Do you have that experience? Absolutely. Yeah, uh, my shooting mentor would always have us do double ear protection with the 50 BMG when we would shoot it. And mm -hmm. that's, that's stuck with me when I'm shooting like a 300 PRC or anything really a big boomer with a brake on it. Like you said, the brake is the worst, especially if you're standing next to the rifle and not behind it, you get right in that blast wave. So our camera guys will, will do that. They'll double up ear pro. Makes it a little harder to communicate on set, but yeah, better, better safe than sorry. I one time had one muff that I had uh, taken off my ear and I had a braked 223 AR I was shooting. I took one shot and my ears rung for weeks and it's I have a, a little bit of serious health issue. I, it yeah. really is. I, I mean, if you know somebody who's older and can't hear things, has tinnitus and stuff like yep. you do not want that. You do not want that. And so I, I'm with you. I wear two, two kinds of ear pro every time I shoot a rifle with a break. I, when on YouTube and stuff, I'll see people hunting with a rifle with a break on it. And there's like, ah, oh, it's just one shot. Like, oh man, you can do lifelong damage yeah. to your body for that one second, it's just not worth yep. it. Anyway, yep. so that's the high end for me. Two kinds of ear pro if I'm shooting a break, period. I, I haven't found any ear pro that's good enough that with a break I say, ah, this mm -hmm. is all I need. Have, haven't seen it. Okay, yep. then just a, a standard rifle with un, you know, without a break on it. I always, usually just one, one ear pro yep. is, is fine uh, with that. and. Um, when I'm hunting, if I'm hunting with a rifle with, you know, never with a break, I just don't hunt with a rifle with a break. It's just too impractical for me. Um, yeah. but, uh, so just a standard rifle, no break on it. When I'm hunting, I always put in a plug before I shoot and I've switched to when I'm hunting to bring the, you know, uh, whatever, like the noise canceling ear pro because mm -hmm. you're trying mm -hmm. to talk with somebody as you're taking the shot and communicate, which one is it? You know, what happened? And if you got ear, <laughs> you can't hear each other. You're like yelling, did I get him? And you know, like yeah. you're trying to be quiet. It's so it's a garage sale trying to take a yep. shot. So when I I'm taking the noise canceling stuff when I when I go out I I like the axle but whichever one you use what would yeah. you use do you use what's your standard ear pro we have the Peltor from 3M we have the axle we have the Caldwell and they they all work pretty good uh, what I've noticed is that it enhances your hearing as well I mean you're amplifying yeah. mm -hmm. everything sometimes it's almost a little distracting every little stick cracking or even yourself breathing. Uh, is is really loud, but also sometimes I've been able to hear more about what the animal is doing, you know, in the in the background because of that. Yeah, and that's why I like the axle. I mean, all of them you can kind of turn up and down the volume, mm -hmm. but I've had several of them that I liked the form factor of it better than the axles. They were just easier, mm -hmm. you know. Some of them were just more of an ear pod style instead of having the cord behind them and stuff. But yep. as soon as you got in even a little bit of wind, it was just done. You couldn't hear anything. Mm -hmm. The axles just do an awesome job of 
dampening down even when it's windy to not make things sound crazy. Anyway, yep. whatever. Um, so I always go one when it's you know unbroken rifle. Then um, if I'm shooting with a can, uh, you know, a suppressor on the rifle. Mm -hmm. If I'm hunting, I don't wear any ear pro. If I'm hunting right. with a suppressor, I'm going to take two shots. It's technically mm -hmm. hearing safe, but still, I, I like to wear ear pro if I'm shooting a suppressor on the range. But hunting yep. two shots, it's probably fine. Um, anyway, it doesn't ring my ears, but it's still, it's, it's a loud noise, you know, uh, with a suppressor on. And then the, the time that I'll take all ear pro off is where it's subsonic ammo, and suppressed mm -hmm. and usually mm -hmm. a, you know an action that'll do it so anyway that's yep. that's kind of what i do what any differences for you no i mean i'm pretty much on the same exact page you know uh, i i'm pretty careful so if i'm shooting an ar with 300 blackout subsonic sometimes they'll still wear ear pro because mm -hmm. you might get a supersonic round in there occasionally and and ah. sometimes it's a, a little bit loud but with the lever gun yeah you don't you don't need it then which is great yeah and you mentioned 22 nrl 22 um that'd be a great time to run a can because if you're running a can and you have subsonic 22 now of course there's all this extreme long range ammo and all that some of that supersonic so if you have the crack you probably still want to have a suppressor on but yeah actually that's a good one to mention so i i shoot a lot of nrl 22 everybody's shooting longish barrels you know for 22 and mm -hmm. heavy and everything like that, bolt, all bolt actions pretty much. And nobody wears ear pro because uh, everybody's shooting subsonic, yep. even without a can. Like, it's just quiet. <laughs> it's so quiet, which is yep. interesting because, like, if I'll shoot like a pistol, even subsonic 22, it's loud. You want mm -hmm. ear pro. But going to the rifle subsonic, I don't know what it is about it, but the, at the NRL 22 competitions, it's, it's just quiet. I, I don't feel any need to wear ear pro, and I'm pretty careful about it. Mm hmm. Yep. Okay, so different question. In general, with a bolt action rifle, what are you looking for in that rifle? Ah, uh, okay, well, for a hunting rifle? Sure. Yeah, you're you're mostly geared towards hunting, so let's let's go that direction. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> the more testing I do, the more I realize that there's just not a lot of accuracy difference between the classes of hunting rifles. By the classes, what I mean is, if we're talking like that Walmart sub $400 hunting rifle, you are shaking up the dice and rolling them. You will very <laughs> often, very often, you'll end up with a, a rifle that'll consistently shoot sub MOA, works great. I would probably say the Ruger American wins that category for the ultra cheap that you're mm -hmm. reliably gonna be shooting sub MOA. In the next class up, let's call it $700 to $1,500, right? This okay. little bit more premium of a hunting rifle. Um, it's rare, very rare, that I see a rifle that just doesn't shoot in that category. Some a little bit more picky than others, but they're pretty dang close to the same. Uh, it's mm -hmm. rare that I see one that dramatically sticks out and you know shooting half MOA every single time with multiple loads. And it's rare that I see one that's eh, more of a two MOA rifle. You might get one squeaking over 1.2, mm -hmm. 1.3, something like that. But you can pretty much reliably say those rifles, if you find a decent load, are going to shoot MOA or maybe a little bit better, maybe three quarter. And then you get into the premium rifles and things kind of, in my experience, kind of start changing back. You get some that shoot exceptionally well and you can get crazy mm -hmm. accuracy with. And then you also see a lot more issues, customer service needs in those rifles. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because they're more on the bleeding edge. Um, they're, they're trying this carbon fiber follower in their magazine to, you know, it's super lightweight, but it might also not feed, right? They're right. trying to get, use match grade chambers, which you leave one little burr in there and all of a sudden we're going over pressure mm -hmm. all the time. You know, there's, they're just stuff that happens in those premium rifles that it's either gonna be really good or you're gonna have some, some issues. So talking in those three classes, I, I think is helpful for people to generally know what to expect. But mm -hmm. the more testing I do, the more I say, eh, you know, if we're talking about Tika versus Bagara, which one's more accurate in general? I can't tell you. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're about on par. They're, they're good mm -hmm. um, in terms of accuracy. And um, 
Also, in the cheap area, you're going to have a lot of feeding problems that pretty much go away uh, later mm -hmm. on. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. you spend at least $700 on a rifle and you probably won't have feeding errors. They kind of fix yep. those, clean those things up. But the biggest differentiator in my mind, the thing that when I'm looking at a gun store and I'm like, which one's cool here? You know, a lot of the actions and accuracy are pretty similar. The thing that differentiates the gun is the stock. Um, and uh, the stocks vary wildly uh, in terms of the quality of the stock. Mm -hmm. um, there's especially because we're so much on this plastic fantastic craze right now in guns that everything's a polymer stock that when right. we're making a cheap polymer stock, that stuff gets real thin um, and real bendy and it can create all kinds of, of issues um, in the gun. Also, um, weight is something that people are buying rifles on. They're looking at that spec, they wanna see what the weight is. And so the rifle, the companies are incentivized to make very sleek, swept back grips, um, you know, skinny yep. little forends that are, you know, rounded <laughs> up there. They're not the adjustable cheek piece because that's often gonna add a, you know, a quarter of a pound. They're just very bare bones stocks. Mm -hmm. And, because they're all injection molded, they're like, oh, we gotta make it look fancy. And so they're just adding, <laughs> checkering <laughs> textures everywhere that um, often just don't even make sense why there's, why, there's why there's texture in a certain spot. So yep. that's what I'm looking for is, it, can I get a rigid stock that will fit me? Um, and that's, that's to me the biggest differentiator for you know, the 700 to $1,500 rifles. I'm mostly looking at the stock. Mm -hmm. and, and, and one point on that, you talked about the flimsy Tupperware stocks. We did a review a while back on a Ruger American Go Wild in 6.5 mm -hmm. Creedmoor. A friend of mine bought that. And I was just so amazed at how readily the forend would touch the barrel if you loaded the bipod slightly to one side or another. And when the rifle was being fired, you got to wonder what's going on. So. Mm -hmm. I, I'm asking myself, A, why wouldn't they make the stock a little bit more rigid up there, but also give me a more generous free float gap, yeah. you know? Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know who's good at that is CVA. Uh, mm. If you've looked at the free float on some of the, like the CVA Cascade, it is huge. <laughs> like they cut nice. out this cavernous hole around the barrel. And I thought, yeah, I mean, if we're going to have a cheap stock that's going to have a little bend in it, don't try to cut it tight. It's not helping anybody. Yep. Yep. And so, yeah, in terms of the, the cheap rifle, a, a CVA Cascade's a really good choice in that $600 range. Tika's a pretty bad offender there. They try to, they have very flimsy stocks that can easily contact. Um, but mm -hmm. I like Tika rifles. Their actions are really good. I wish they'd thread their muzzles more. Uh, but they're, yep. they're good rifles, don't get me wrong, but their stocks are not the best. Bergara, I love Bergara. In fact, they're, they're probably what I recommend the most for you know that kind of price point, you know, uh, of a hunting rifle. Bergaras are just really consistent quality rifles. I see very few customer service issues with Bergara rifles um, or just you know major build errors. Um, but the rifles are often a little bit heavier. Um, I think it's mm -hmm. Graybow that they're using for their stocks, and they're a little bit chunkier, mm -hmm. uh, more fiberglass in there. They're rigid, but they're a little bit heavier. And so, uh, yeah, there's that. Yeah, trade-offs, definitely. I also, so a couple of things I look for in a, in, in a rifle, regardless of whether it's hunting or not, is Remington 700 footprint and Remington 700 compatible trigger hanger, which Bergara put in, uh, in, in both cases, which is just yep. smart. You know, we have the B14R rimfire, we have multiple, you know, center fire rifles and we do we switch it up we put them in different stocks depending on what we're doing and you know that's that's a plus i like i like your note about the threaded muzzle you know why why not in this in this day and age have it if the tc compass can throw it on there <laughs> everybody should okay so how i shot my tc compass like i shot a bullet at it <laughs> oh really <laughs> I, did you put I that in the up? video yeah, I did. It was set up 50 yards away from me, and we shot a bullet from a different rifle. So we shot a bullet into the barrel of the TC Compass. Uh, it wow. was really cool. Um, I'll check that yeah, out. Yeah, we did it with the super slow mo camera so that you could see it like 
the bullet comes into the barrel of the TC Compass, goes through it, and then you just see this dust fly out of the action. It was really cool. <laughs> That's awesome. But two other areas of, of this hunting rifle to discuss. Triggers and carbon fiber barrels, yay or nay? Let's take triggers first. Yeah, uh, I love a nice light trigger. Um, I Usually my ideal is just barely a smidge under two pounds is great for me. Um, and I keep it consistent in all my rifles as much as I can because mm -hmm. I don't want to, you know, go to a hunting rifle and accidentally cook off around too soon because I wasn't mm -hmm. used to that trigger. Yep. Unfortunately, there's a spec that for the rifle manufacturers that many of them, but not all of them follow, uh, of how heavy a trigger should be on a hunting rifle. And mm -hmm. so if a, a rifle is, is targeted at hunt at hunters, then they have to put a heavier trigger in there. This is Browning's problem. Browning mm. has lawyer triggers. They're good quality. Right. They, they break really even, but they're lawyer triggers. They're so heavy, like four and a half pounds, uh, wow. which is fine if you're used to that, but most people would at least like to be able to adjust down to, you know, two or three pounds. Um, yep. They're pretty heavy uh, in those rifles, and they it's not that they can't make a better trigger. They can, yep. and in their, they have a Browning X-Bolt that's kind of more of a match. I can't remember mm -hmm. what they call it, a target one anyway. And they have a nice light trigger in there, but they just don't do it in the other ones, and so that's that's frustrating. Others of the manufacturers say, well, we're going to do it, and you know, a lot of them mm -hmm. will adjust down to two and a half pounds, something like that, which I think is very reasonable. I, I don't see that as unsafe in any way. It's not even close to a hair trigger. Um, I prefer a two-stage trigger is my favorite in mm -hmm. general. Um, mm -hmm. You don't see them too often, but I prefer a two, uh, especially being hunting. I just feel like when I move that first stage, I feel like, okay, I'm on it, you know? Yep. Sometimes yep. I, it just, it's helpful for me. Um, yeah, so I guess that, that's where I am with triggers. I, I don't go crazy light because I don't want to have that one rifle that's totally different than everything else. Yeah. And I prefer a two-stage. So if you want to try a great two-stage, if you haven't already, the Trigger Tech Remington 700 Diamond two-stage, I have that on, on one of my hunting rifles. The thing is amazing. It's a little spendy, but really, and I, for hunting, I'm, I'm with you. That bringing it in and feeling that second stage, you know you're right there, and yep. then... Yeah, no, it's cool. So, so sell me on the diamond, because when I did my seven PRC build, I went pretty high end on everything. I was, I mm -hmm. went a little crazy on that one. But on the trigger, I came down to what's the other one? Uh, I, I think it's just the trigger tech. Is it called the hunter? What's it called? Oh, special. Yeah, the yeah, special. The special. I have yeah, that. yeah, the special. So, sell Great me on choice. the diamond. Why should I have bought the diamond? So, I like the feel of the diamond, and and I actually run most of my triggers at about seven ounces. Oh, so, you're real light. Okay. Under a half pound. And that's just because that's my style. I'm shooting off the bench a lot. And I've gotten used to that. So on a hunting rifle, I would run a special at minimum, which is what? Okay. Around a pound or so? And yeah, again, something like that. I will typically chamber around. I'll throw the safety on. And then I personally feel confident. Obviously very good with trigger discipline. And it, it works. I'm not suggesting that anybody else should run a trigger that light. But for me... I'm kind of like in your camp. I like everything set up at least in the same order of magnitude so it's not a big training exercise or a surprise. The, the diamond, when you get down into those lower weights, has a, a very, very crisp you know, trigger pull, very predictable, works good with the bat actions that I use. So that's the reason that I use them. I, I use the single stage for all my real precision work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah, that's good. I, I, tr I usually don't adjust my triggers on uh, any of the kind of factory rifles because I want to mm -hmm. be able to review every gun as it comes in the box. Not that yep. they aren't adjustable, but most people won't. You know, most guys mm -hmm. are just going to keep it what it is. And so I try to keep them stock as much as possible. Yep. But there are some triggers out there right now. Oh, a terrible offender of this is the CZ... Uh, is it 720? I can't remember a shotgun I bought for my okay. kids. I, my son was shooting at a 20 gauge. <laughs> He's sh we're shooting for a minute and he sh shoots the first shot and he said, the safety's on. 
and he didn't get the shot on. And then I look at it and I was like, no, the safety's not on. And so he goes and shoots. And then a minute later, I look over at him and he has two <laughs> fingers in the trigger guard pulling the trigger. And I'm like, who taught you to shoot that way? And he's like, yeah. I can't pull it with one finger. <laughs> I checked the trigger pull. It's almost nine pounds. Um, and shotguns are usually heavier. And there's good reason for that. But nine pounds uh, on a youth rifle. He literally couldn't pull the trigger with one finger. Wow. Um, it's just, it's gotten a little crazy, the lawyer triggers in some of the guns right now. Yep. And you mentioned earlier, you know, compatibility looking for Remington 700. Um, that's a really big one because of this issue. You know, if, yep. if we're shooting a you know, Reming, you know, Remington, I'm talking about a shotgun here, but you know, if we're talking about Remington 700 in a rifle, um, it's so nice to be able to just like, ah, I don't like the trigger, go get another one. No big deal. It's like mm -hmm. Legos, right? Yep. Um, same thing with the threading. I don't mean to jump on Browning again because I really like a lot that Browning does with their rifles, but at, they're doing all of their threading in metric designations. And so a lot of gunsmiths won't even take Browning rifles. They don't have the tooling to work with them. Um, and it's just, it's different than what everybody else is. Their suppressor or their, uh, sorry, the threaded muzzle. Well, everybody's threading 5.8's 24 these days, not Browning. They're doing their own thing. Um, really? And so only their SR line and not even all of those, but only yeah. their SR line are threaded 5.8's 24. Everything else, I can't remember, it's M something. And 13, mm -hmm. I can't remember. And uh, what uh, it could be 14, 14 by yeah. one. That's what the AK uses. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so it's it's frustrating. You got to buy a little adapter to yep. add your can on. It's like, it's not that it's proprietary. Anybody can do it, but nobody does that in the United States. And so yep. it, what it ends up being is you either need an adapter or you need to use the Browning um, muzzle brake. They don't make a can, you yep. know, it, that's just, that's really frustrating. Everybody else is on the standard, so. Yeah, uh, I, I had that issue Avoiding things with like Hala. that is big. Yeah, Howa has metric threads for the receiver uh, mm -hmm. interface on the on the barrel, and when you do it on an English spec lathe, you have to leave the half nut uh, lever engaged, turn off the lathe after each pass, stop it, back the tool out, put it in reverse, scoot back, because you can't, once it's locked, you have to follow that same tooling interface mm -hmm. and it just it's it's a pain and it takes a bit, a bit more time and and another nod to Bergara Spanish company they're using I think it's one in the 16 by six, uh, six, uh, 16 TPI threading like a Remington 700 does so it's not quite compatible with Remington 700 prefit barrel but yeah definitely something gunsmiths are going to be used to so let's move on then to carbon fiber barrels now with a hunting rifle you're not going to sit there like you are with a competition rifle and just heat the heck out of that barrel shooting 10, 15, 20, 30 shots. It's typically, like you were saying, one to three shots, right? Mm -hmm. So the carbon fiber gets you some weight savings, but it does have the penalty of the cost, and it's always a bit of a wild card. What, what has your experience been with, with carbon barrels on hunting guns? In general, I love carbon fiber barrels. When I'm reviewing a rifle with the, you know, spaghetti noodle, super thin barrel, oh, they are frustrating to review. So frustrating to review. I mean, uh, I reviewed, what was that rifle? It was the worst. Um, Kimber Mountain Ascent. I don't hear much about Kimber's yeah. rifles anymore, but the Mountain right. Ascent a few years ago was a big deal. Anyway, um, that rifle was so frustrating to review because honestly, the third shot would kick out. Um, like it would shoot two and then it was hot and it would start kicking shots. Um, and huh. so it, it was just so thin. It was just causing issues when you're shooting something with a, you know, bull barrel, nice big bull barrel, you worry a lot less about heat. It's just so much more forgiving, um, to work with and test accuracy mm -hmm. on. And so I like those, you know, real nice stiff barrels, especially mm -hmm. in hunting because you carry, you care so much about the cold bore shot. Right, and so yeah. you, um, so it's a big advantage. But um, they're they're heavy, having the the you know big bull barrels. So 
I think carbon fiber on hunting rifle is a really nice, nice fit because most hunting rifles are never going to get burned out on the barrel. You know, a PRS mm -hmm. shooter doesn't want a carbon fiber barrel because they're replacing them every two months. They need a new barrel, right? right? Um, uh, but a, to a hunter, that's not something to worry about. Uh, it's going to help you with your cold bore shot. I, I think it's mm -hmm. a really nice fit. I like carbon carbon barrels. I have had some that were better than others, but in general, I love them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that the cold bore shot tends to be consistent and that it's that when, when the barrel is heating up, that's where things will start to get, you know, a little bit crazy yeah yeah so, so let's talk about this whole rifle market segment and let's again focus on hunting we've got a theme going here what do you think are some market segments that are overpopulated and what are some segments or or product opportunities that are underpopulated i think the sig cross is the ultimate opportunity right now uh, for hunting rifles um, hmm. and i say the sig cross i'm meaning that that kind of platform um, okay. for a rifle. Um, so uh, those who don't know, uh, Sig Cross is a, a lot of people see it on a store shelf and think it's an AR, uh, if you don't know what you're mm -hmm. looking at, but it's a traditional bolt action hunting rifle, but it has a folding stock. Um, they have an edition of it, the born and raised edition that has an arc rail full length on the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. like it's a very modern rifle. And I think the first time that I actually took that rifle out hunting and I folded up the stock and I put it in my bag and it wasn't snagging on trees everywhere and stuff. It was like, oh, this is nice. And it has adjustable <laughs> cheek piece, all the things you would expect. It's going to make you a better shooter. And when I look at, gosh, I need to go get a gun. When I look <laughs> at the rifles of today, they are just not designed to shoot. And I'll show you what I mean. I don't mean to pick on a particular company here. This is just an example as a lot of rifles, but let's just look at your average hunting rifle today is not mm -hmm. designed to be a good shooter. So this is a great stock line for standing up and on your fox hunt, you're gonna go shoot, right? <laughs> but in a hunting situation today, a standing shot, uh, it's only happened to me uh, maybe once or twice ever uh, that that's right. happened. Um, and so I want shootability. Also, people want to take their rifle hunting and then go to the range the next day. They want to be able to punch some paper mm -hmm. too, right? Mm -hmm. And so this rifle, this is where I sit with my cheek weld. I can't see the scope at all. I can see straight under the scope. I've right. got to raise up to there. <laughs> That's where I can see through the scope. And so you don't have a consistent cheek weld. And so in a hunting situation, you drop to the floor, you're trying to get on the scope, you got to do a little hovering mm -hmm. till you get mm -hmm. in the right spot. It's not a rifle that just, boom, you're there, it fits you perfectly, right? Mm -hmm. The four ends are rounded. Why would you want that? If you're trying to rest on you know, a, a tree limb or whatever, why would you want a rounded foreign? That makes no sense. You want that thing flat as a pancake uh, down there so that it, help, it aids the rifle to sit flat. Mm -hmm. These sling studs are not a good attachment point for a bipod. They're, that is yep. the most wobbly, weird connection we could possibly have. <laughs> um, and so there are just so many things about just the traditional stock that just don't make a lot of sense for today's hunter. Um, plus, you just have all of this length back here that's you know sticking up out of your pack on trees and stuff when we could fold that around, you know? And yep. so um, I think the modern stock or chassis designs, uh, specifically chassis designs, I should say, um, are just make so much more sense and will like honestly make you a better shooter. Uh, just having a better attachment point for a bipod w w makes a big difference for you. So that's what mm -hmm. I'm excited about. I'm, I'm, I expected to walk around SHOT Show this year after the SIG Cross has been out a couple years now. I expected this mm -hmm. to be the year of the SIG Cross clone, and nobody's doing it. It's just the same mm -hmm. old stock lines that just are a little bit impractical. Mm -hmm. No, I think you make a lot of really good points, and you're, in you're inspiring me either to do a rifle build or just a story with some of the gear that we have, which is the multi-purpose rifle. You know, mm -hmm. if it's, let's use a six Creed more for, as an example, that'd be something that you'd want to take to the range. You'd want to punch steel at a thousand with, but if you converted it, took some weight off. And so this, I, I really like the Hawkins Precision Hunter mag. Have you seen this thing? No, it's, I don't know what that is. 
It's a metal AICS magazine and it only sticks down so far as so that you can grab it and, and pull it out of the rifle. I'm going to go offset now and grab one. <clears throat> Everybody's running around. We're like, it's show and yeah. tell time. <laughs> Do you see that? So uh, yeah. this, yeah. So this is literally. Let me take this out. I can grab it because just this little lip sticks down, mm -hmm. and this is a three round, three oh eight. I'm using it in a twenty two GT here, and it's it's all metal. It's really nice. It's a little spendy again, but look at that. It's it's not gonna. It's not going to snag on anything. I could even put my backpack under this part of the rifle if I needed to, you know, take a shot. And so this one doesn't have the folder on it, but this is kind of what you're talking about. This is an XLR yes. element magnesium and I've Which got a, a carbon barrel and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Yeah, you're right. And that XLR element, that's a great stock. That's one of them. And uh, the other that I would put in there for sure Ooh. is the MDT Hunt 26. This yes. thing is on obtainium right now. Um, they're hard that to a, find. That was, that's a long action, it looks like. It is, yep. Cool. What, um, what is that chambered in? 7 PRC. Oh, nice. Um, so it's carbon fiber. I can fold the stock mm -hmm. um, so that it makes it a tiny little light, tiny little package. It's a 20 inch barrel um, yep. on my 7 PRC. I decided to go super short. Um, it has a flat fore end with full length Arca, so I can attach whatever I want there. We have M lock slots. QD flush cups make so much more sense than sling studs, so you can just put your yep. sling in there and it's not protruding out and stuff. Like you look at this stock and it's like, that is honestly, the design is really simple. It's not mm -hmm. terribly complicated. It's lighter, it's more skeletonized, um, it has an adjustable cheek piece. Like, I really feel like this is what the market wants everybody to start yeah. doing. This stock is on obtainium, like they're months out yep. um, in, in production. The XLR element is way out in production. Uh, the SIG Cross has yep. been red hot on the market. So why aren't more people copying them is kind of how I feel. Um, exactly. I'd like to see more. No, I, I, I think you made good points. So the HNT26 we put together was a short action. We did it as a 6.5 PRC. And to your point earlier about something folding up, you don't want the buttstock snagging on things. I took a Ruger precision rifle hunting one time, a couple times mm -hmm. actually. I lost the end of, of the, the uh, buttstock. It just oh, came shoot. off in the bushes and <laughs> detached itself because it was snagging on everything. And uh. MDT made that sort of almost melted design and it's all kind of enclosed on the buttstock. It's got double jointed folder mm -hmm. and very simple interface. And, and again, when we braked it properly and, and that kind of thing, the recoil wasn't bad at all, even with the 6.5 PRC. So I'm with you. St lots of good options. And I love Arca. I, we've just pretty much completely moved over to Arca because of its flexibility, its solid, and then QD cups on the side gets your sling in place. Yeah, totally love it. Yeah, it's it's so much better. Like you look at that sling stud compared to a QD flush cup, and it's like <laughs> the the materials cost is the same here, right? This is not right. expensive to make a QD flush cup, and it's just yep. it's just a better attachment point for a sling. Um, and I, like, why why do, why don't we adopt it? It's so weird to me how slow some of the manufacturers are to adopt things uh, yep. in the industry. Well, and and we I guess that's the other thing is this sling stud. Now you're shooting on bags. What happens every shot? Yeah. Yep. Raking yep. on. It just it doesn't make any sense to have that <laughs> attachment point. Yep. No, I'm I'm 100% with you. Um, this this actually makes me want to go hunting with you. I'm I'm sorry that I couldn't join you on that Mexico trip. I appreciate that last minute invitation. But at some oh man, point, I wanted to have you there. That was fun. Oh geez. After watching your video, I'm having FOMO big time after the fact. Uh, but uh, it'd, be, it'd be great to do that sometime. And, and here at Ultimate Reloader, one of my dreams for this coming year is to build what we're going to call the Safari Loop, which would be kind of a simulated, simulated hunting course. You walk through the trees. You can shoot off a tree. Uh, you can shoot over obstacles off of uh, a log with your backpack. You can prone out and take a shot out to 400 and 600 yards. And 
you could take some of these rifles we've been discussing and put them through their paces and have steel animal targets at appropriate ranges, near and really far, and provide the viewers with kind of an experience like you're on a hunt without having mm -hmm. to go and hope an animal presents itself, if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, you know, it'd be way fun for that is to have a couple moving animals as well to practice. Um, I, you know, sometimes I'll have a moving shot on a coyote and stuff and I'm like, I don't, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just wildly guessing what lead I'm <laughs> supposed to have on this gun, you know? And until you've coyote hunted for 10 years and shot at a hundred of them, you don't really yep. know what it's supposed to be. It's very hard to practice that. You know, even in competitions, they'll have movers, but it's really just, yep. you know, this slow a little. It's not like a running deer yeah. uh, kind of thing. And so <laughs> it's rare to get an opportunity to, to practice some things like that. Yeah, and, and the really I, good coyote hunters, they will have both eyes open. They'll be tracking the animal wide, wide with one eye and looking through the scope with the other and be able to pull the shot and have the perfect lead. Much respect for those guys. I need to go coyote hunting again because I have been, I mean, my soul has been shredded uh, because <laughs> like, uh, what, six weeks ago I went coyote hunting and I missed a coyote at 175 yards. How does that even happen? How do you miss the whole animal at 175 <laughs> yards? I, like it has been bothering me so much. And so I took that rifle out and again, I was like, I, scope's gotta be off. And it just prints tiny little half minute groups every time. It's a Bagara yeah. Premier approach. And I'm like, uh -huh. dang it, the scope was on. I have no excuse. And I think like, you know, a coyote, whatever, it has big fur, but the actual rat yep. in there is a small animal. But still, it's like 10 inches and I missed. I shot above the animal and it, it has been driving me crazy. So I got to get back out there. No, I'm, I'm with you. I just bought an electronic call. I've been thinking about this guy, this 22 GT mm -hmm. and potentially throwing the ATN day night scope on it so I can get that you know recoil activated shot or whatever. Yeah. And I still haven't, I haven't killed one ever. And it's, it's bucket list material. So, so yeah, on that note, let's talk about Jim's bucket list shooting experiences. If there are, are, are one or multiple that you can think of that you'd like to do. And of course you'd probably bring that to the channel, I'm sure. Yeah, sure. Well, a, a couple that I, I have liked and a couple that I, I would like to. In terms of hunting, the one that is number one on, number one on my list right now is a caribou. Reason mm -hmm. caribou, mm -hmm is because we're sitting there in the living room, all calm one day. And my wife turns to me, no kidding, this truly happened. And she said, why haven't you shot like a really pretty animal, like a caribou to go above the fireplace? And I was like, what? what? Nobody's wife ever says that in the history yeah. of man. That's never happened that a wife was like, we just need more taxidermy in our house. And so when my wife said that, I'm like, honey, this is going to happen. This will occur. So anyway, I need to get a, a caribou hunt plan. She, I said, well, like, what about like a red stag or something like that? She's like, no, it's caribou. That is a beautiful animal. I'm like, okay, okay, it's great. Let's do this. So anyway, that's a big one for me. I want to go hunt caribou, see if I can make it happen this fall, but uh, we'll have to put some plans together for that one. Um, I, I would like to shoot more competition. Um, mm -hmm. one issue is I don't shoot on Sundays for religious reasons. I dedicate that day to church stuff. Um, and so I, it hurts my ability. A lot of times I want to go shoot. Like I love NRL Hunter. It is so fun. That is an awesome, uh, awesome competition, but they're always Saturday, Sunday matches. Like for all of 2023, hundred percent of them are Saturday, Sunday matches. And so I think, ah, am I going to go pay and, and travel and stuff to just shoot half a match? I don't know about that. I've really enjoyed right. Uh, NRL 22 for that reason. It's a one day, you know, it happened. There's local matches everywhere. Mm -hmm. Start to finish, you're done in three hours. You can go watch your kid's soccer game and stuff. Uh, I love that. NRL 22 is, it's a kick. Um, it's really fun because it's really, you are doing long distance shooting. It's just compressed, right? Yeah. Like a 120 yeah. yard shot with a 22 is pretty similar to making a thousand yard shot with, with a different rifle. Like the, the drop mm -hmm. is pretty steep at 120, to, uh, at 120 yards when you're shooting. 
uh, subsonic 22 and you know you've got to really pay attention to wind even at 100 yards uh, so it's i really like doing those that's a fun competition to shoot hmm. i'd also like to do uh, to get better at pistol do some competition pistol i'm trash with a with a handgun um, and so i'd i'd like to figure that one out but in terms of uh, experiences that i've enjoyed the most it's hunting in south africa it is incredible mm. uh, incredible there it's so different uh, than hunting in in the u.s especially in the west because you know where you you'll be hunting a mule deer for a week and you're hoping you're going to get one in South Africa, you will probably see 15 different species and 50 different animals before wow. noon. Um, it's incredible just how many different species they have and stuff. And so the hunting becomes different. It's about, you know, you're not going to have a hard time finding a wildebeest. Um, <laughs> it's doing it in the way you want and, and uh, picking the exact one you want. Um, out yep. of the herd because they're pretty much all herd animals. Anyway, that's a that was that's been an incredible experience, especially because I've been able to take my kids with me a couple times to go. Um, mm -hmm. In wow. fact, for one of my kids, it was their first hunt, and they got to go to Africa. And I said, "You just killed more animals in a week than most people will ki will kill in their lifetime." You know, just you know, yeah. deer hunter every fall, and every couple of years you get one. Uh, so it's mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I really enjoy that. That's fun. That is super, and you're making me think about my bucket list because I have, I know Pete Milan, Impact Shooting, we were talking yep. about him, he's down there, and I see his hunts, and I think, wow, I gotta do that. But it's such, it's such a commitment of time, right? You're gonna have to dedicate a couple weeks, maybe a few weeks, and that's, that's a big commitment. Yeah, it's a, you know, at least a 10 day uh, trip, including mm -hmm. uh, travel to get down there. But the price is one that I think most people don't realize. You mm -hmm. will, you can spend less flying to South Africa, including you know, including your travel. You can spend less than going on a deer or elk hunt in the West. Um, wow! It and you could kill multiple animals while you're there. So mm -hmm. most outfitters will have some kind of like welcome to Africa, four thousand dollar package. You kill like four big game animals in a week for $4,000. Mm -hmm. Then your flight's gonna be a thousand bucks, you're five grand. Uh, deer and elk outfitters, the prices are crazy. So crazy right yeah. now. Um, yeah. And that's after you get your tag. Um, and then you pay for the outfitter and getting your tag, we're all forced to play Powerball these days uh, with hunting tags. I, I'm a resident of Utah and I have to play the lotto to see if I get a tag that year. <laughs> Um, right. it's, it's crazy anyway. So you're applying for multiple years. Um, and then you pay the outfitter. It's cheaper to go to Africa. Um, right. and the experience is just amazing. It's so cool, but it, they're different experiences too. I, it certainly doesn't replace Western hunting. Uh, they're just nah, different yeah. experiences, but if you're, if you're out there and you want to pull a trigger on something and, you know, <laughs> actually get to see an animal, you should go to South Africa. All right. Well, it's now on my bucket list officially. Um, another question. This is kind of the, the final big question. When you look forward and you think about backfire over the next year, over the next few years, what can we all expect to see? Uh, I think, well, in terms of business, I, we're making some gun accessories that will come out pretty soon. Um, different things that, you know, actual physical, physical products that I'm really excited about those, those physical products. Cause there are some things like we were just looking at the stock, but there are some parts, some gun accessories that I'm just like, why is it like this? It could be so much better. Um, so I'm excited about that. But in terms of the content, um, I think what's the excitement for me is that backfires gotten to a place as a business earning enough that I can say no to anything I want to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that means I can just focus the videos on what's cool. Um, yeah. And I, I was offered uh, about $5,000 just this week, do one video for five grand. Uh, and I mm -hmm. said, I don't think the viewers are gonna like it. It's not a cool topic. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna get a ton of views. I think it'll be yeah. kind of a boring subject for them and I can skip that. 
Um, right. And that's really exciting for me because, you know, I don't fault anybody, you know, as you're growing a channel, or whatever, and you got to take what comes in the door to try to work. But it's, it's exciting for me where every video I put out, I'm either really proud of it or it doesn't go out. Um, and so that's what I'm most excited about is I can, you know, I, I have my, my list of all the videos coming up <laughs> and man, I, it's just, it's dang cool uh, to yeah. see all the different stuff that I, I get to explore based on what I think is cool. Yeah, no, I, I think that all sounds awesome. Um, I'm in a similar position where we're really busy and we're doing cool stuff and we can't do everything. So we get to pick the, the cool stuff. Uh, including one of the things I'm excited about is building an ELR rifle. This thing is crazy. Oh, yeah. You know, like, all right, well, that's a whole new domain. I get to meet some really cool people like Paul Phillips, who's a king of two mile, king of one mile champion, and uh, learn from them, build a new rifle, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really great thing. It's been fun getting to know you and to be able to bounce ideas off each other, even including talking about 7PRC this summer behind the scenes before I was allowed to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All that good stuff. So uh, if you wanna know more about Jim's channels, definitely look up Backfire on YouTube and uh, backfiretv.com, is that correct, for the website? Uh, just backfire.tv, yep. Backfire.tv, and uh, definitely make sure you're subscribed. My question for you all is, A, do you have a favorite Backfire video that you've watched or story that Jim has published? Please drop a comment and say thanks to Jim for that. And second, what would you like to see Jim focus on? Is there a particular rifle that you'd like to see him review, a cartridge that you'd like to see him shoot? Drop a comment and we'll start that discussion. Thank you Jim, again, Jim, for joining us. Really appreciate the time. Awesome to be on here. Awesome. That concludes this video, and that means it's time to wrap it up. I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, we're on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, where we've got unrestricted content, and Instagram. Make sure to follow us on all those channels. Ultimate Reloader also has a commercial solutions division serving law enforcement, the military, and the gun industry. We have some unique capabilities, including a comprehensive suite of recoil testing and evaluation capabilities, trigger profiling, and more. If you're interested in custom rifles like what we build here on the channel or gunsmithing services, you're going to want to go to rifles.ultimatereloader.com and get on the wait list. If you're interested in becoming a professional gunsmith, check out the Sonoran Desert Institute. They've got a degree program, they've got a certificate program, and you can study from home. Learn more at sdi.edu. Thanks again for watching.